Welcome back to another episode of Palisade Radio. I'm your host, Karema Mutlu. And on today's show, we have John Newell, who is a portfolio manager at Fieldhouse Capital Management. Welcome back to the show, John. Uh, thanks for having me back, Karem. It's a pleasure. Let's begin by talking about how you started Fieldhouse Capital Management. I understand it began from a frustration of not being able to fully invest in the precious metals and commodity space within your previous firm. So can you talk about this and how you came to the conclusion that precious metals were the place to be back then? Okay, well, Fieldhouse Capital Management was sort of born out of the advisory side of a, of a brokerage company in Vancouver, and um, they were not really interested in expanding that side of the business, so we recapitalized Fieldhouse Capital Management, and we registered across uh, Canada with all the provincial regulatory bodies and, and with the designation of portfolio managers, um, investment fund managers, and an exempt market dealer, um, off we went to sort of tackle the world in, in, a, in a way that we saw it. So each portfolio manager has sort of a different mandate, and mine happened to be uh, precious metals. And while I was sort of a broad-based manager, you know, at times, uh, Graham and Dodd, uh, Philip Fisher, some of those old um, teachers of mine through books, I I got interested in precious metals first in 2001 when I saw a higher low, and then again in December of 2013 when I started to see Canadian companies outperform. So I um, Canadian precious metals companies start to outperform in late 2013. So I built a pilot fund around that thesis and that was uh, a Cisco, Caden, Probe, Kirkland Lake, Gannett Goldfields, Lakeshore, Orico. Those companies actually bottomed in late, mid, late 2013. And so as they were going up, the market was still the broad-based sort of precious metals were still going down uh, into the lows of late two th- December of 2015, January of 2016, which I make an assumption that that is a major bottom in the market, something akin to 2001 when many, many cycles Converged. So, for the purpose of this interview, I'm making an assumption that 2016, January of 2016, was a, a, a major low on the market. And, and then we took off for seven months and had a longer, deeper correction than one would expect in a bull market, but we've never gone below the 2016 lows. And then there are companies that are outperforming like Kirkland Lake and Bema Gold and mid cap um, companies that have gone sideways up and down nowhere in that two and a half year period, but they still have held their gains. They're nowhere near their 2013. 16 lows. So those shares are, in my opinion, registering that we have gone sideways, much like the Australian um, All Ordinaries Gold Index. It, it went sideways and it's breaking to new highs. And now we have many of these sort of mid cap juniors trying to make new highs right here, right now. So just like 2013, there are special situations um, that in this market that look um, 
pretty attractive, uh, irrespective of what gold does on a daily basis. So I'm looking at renovation stories. I call them renovation stories where um, uh, management has gone in, recapitalized old mines, look at them differently geologically. Uh, I would use um, uh, Leah Gold, uh, um, Equinox Gold, uh, Philo, those kinds of companies. I'm not recommending them here right now. I'm just pointing out that they really have, K92 is another one that has really um, shown, you know, strong relative strength. So there are really um, good opportunities in this precious metals market if you, um, if, if, if you do your homework. That's a, that's a long answer, but... <laughs> no, excellent. Okay. Well, before the interview, you sent over a few charts regarding some gold juniors that you're currently watching, and with an explanation about the recent price action and where those stocks may go in the future if the technicals line up. So you touched on it briefly, but give us a sense of what you look for in a resource company. And I understand one of the key factors you look for is companies that hold up better in down markets. And a great example of that is perhaps Kirkland Lake Gold. So can you talk to us a bit more about this? Yeah, um, so I I look at, first of all, I'm looking for stocks that um, are showing strong relative strength. Um, I like to look for, you know, higher highs and higher lows and um, volume increases or, or technical analysis, intermarket relationships and, and et cetera. Um, but that doesn't preclude looking at, you know, the discount to um, uh, net asset value or, or um, um, price to cash flow, uh, PE ratios. All, all those are part of it. Um, but I like to look at why is – why was Kirkland Lake behaving in a way that was different than, say, Gold Corp, which has gone sideways, up and down, and very volatile, but really its price action is the same. Its price today is the same as it was 25 years ago, and it's the same with um, with uh, American Barrett. And, and so I'm looking for companies – with exceptional management that have a, you know, a good plan and, um, uh, can exploit, uh, tremendous assets. So the chart that I sent you, one of these, one of the charts I sent with three targets was, um, K92 and I had the opportunity to speak with the, the chairman. Uh, the CEO, um, John Lewin, and he really laid out a plan of what he was going to do with that company. And it sounded really plausible to me. He sounded like he really had an action plan. And um, then I looked at the technicals and, and derived uh, three targets from sort of a, a system I have of deriving targets. So, yeah, so so there are really strong stocks in this kind of choppy precious metals market where since the waterfall drop in 2013, we've kind of danced around in that up and down in gold itself. But in the meantime, there are some precious metal shares that have done extremely well, which yeah, mid caps and uh, exploration plays, explore, exploration plays like Great Bear or West Haven, 
just to name a couple, I'm, I'm not recommending them today, right now, as we speak. I'm just pointing out that my favorite sector, part of, uh, my favorite part of the sector is the mid cap juniors that, that, and, 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 and mid cap seniors that, that could merge and, um, and then the exploration plays. And the exploration plays are defined really by not just the property, but the, you know, the tremendous, there's a dance between the financiers of these mines, us, <laughs> the geos, the drillers, the prospectors, and the management that's trying to move the project down the field, so to speak. And it's, um, it, that's where the, you have to really do a lot of homework because, um, you know, not all junior resource stocks are the same. And right now, like I was pointing out in those charts that I sent you, we're starting to see the beginnings of a turn in some of the more junior exploration plays that are well-run, you know, elite teams of um, uh, of geos and geophysicists and drillers and prospectors too that that are, are now going in to um, you know to start uh, what looks like a very exciting growing season ahead. Excellent. Okay, John, you've had over 30 years of investment experience and you've been an investment advisor with some of the largest investment funds in Canada. So can you talk to us about some of the key themes or lessons that the markets have taught you? And after 30 years, is there still anything left to learn? <clears throat> well, um, you know, I have a library of books really going back to the early 1900s, and I'm sure there's books before that, but um, I, I look at guys like uh, John Bogle, um, who recently passed away, I think at, at, you know, in 90, was still on CNBC, uh, T. Boone Pickens, uh, um, uh, Warren Buffett. I, I mean, these guys, I think, are getting better with uh you get better with age in this business because experience really um really counts and so it's a lifelong uh learning experience um i've uh, and and so philip fisher is a kind of a hero of mine and even benjamin graham and some of those guys that really uh, there's a a whole host from Dow to uh, Gartley, um, Prechter and Frost, uh, a whole bunch of um, um, a whole bunch of technicians, John Murphy, that I, I, I admire a lot. So there, it, it's a lifelong learning experience. You can never sort of give up and. And I often use the Alpha Minerals as an example. They had uh, fifteen hundred dollars left in the bank. They had cobbled up uh, funds to drill a, a last hole. The stock was around five cents, and um, it was ultimately taken out for I think around four dollars and fifty cents. And it went there in a heartbeat or two. And, and so you can never um, count uh, companies out. A trillion was two two dollars and seventy cents. It went to seventy cents, and then it went to forty dollars. So pe people in this space have to have patience and really have to believe that the the management team and the guys are pursuing something, not in the not not just it's not just a make work project that they really believe that there is um um an, an important uh project under, underneath the ground they're working on 
so yeah, it's it's um, it, it's like a, a never give up, uh, always learning career. Okay, some great advice there. So as we begin to wrap up the show, John, what else is currently on your mind that you can share with our listeners? And perhaps your current thoughts on the price action of gold since the beginning of the year? What are your thoughts on this? Well, yeah, last, uh, just on the price of gold, um, the, the, the last major chart I put out was uh, on August the 22nd and forecasted three targets uh, 1280, uh, 13, this area that we're in and, 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 and then we have to get through that, 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 uh, 1370. If we, if we do 1410 and 1490, I think are possible, um, it, really in the first half of this year, but it's a formidable barrier. Um, so I, I, I mean, a person has to concentrate, uh, if they're investing in the space, I think on, you know, companies that could merge and, and, um, help each other out, exploration plays and, um, uh, you know, just companies that are starting to really make money at current prices and, and not looking at those forward prices. Um, I, I, I wanted to go off topic a little bit and just, um, recite a Robert service poem or part of it, uh, that really kind of, um, was etched in my memory from, from my father reading these, poems to me as a kid, if, if that's okay. Um, but it goes something like, there's gold and it's haunting and haunting, and it's luring me on as of old. Yet it isn't the gold that I'm wanting so much as just finding the gold. I wanted the gold and I got it, came out with a fortune last fall, yet Somehow life's not what I thought it. And somehow the gold isn't all. And, and I read that because people have to understand that, you know, financiers of gold companies have lined the walls of the Smithsonian Institute with art. And the Hearst Castle was built, and all the artwork that's down there was built on um, Homestake Mines, which was in the Black Hills and really one of the richest mines in North America, if not the richest. And so, you know, really what I'm trying to say when I recite that is that Mining is a really important part of our society and, and it's a, a valued, um, enterprise and, and pursuit. And I think that, um, you know, just knowing the people whose, you know, dreams are met or dreams are, are broken and, and to see the, people come back from adversity it, it is just a real privilege to, to be a part of this industry. <laughs> I'm getting a bit, maybe a bit emotional about it, but that, that that's how I feel. No, very good. Okay. Once again, thanks very much for your time today, John. It was great having you on the show. I'm sure we'll have you back on the show later in the year. All right. Take care. Thank you. think you understand the junior mining sector and you think that the participants in the mining sector, junior mining sector, are good people and kind people, hit the bit. How violent that term could be, it actually could be quite violent. Uh, it could be a rip-your-face-off uh, uranium rally. And the world is always going to need raw material. It's going to need copper and gold and nickel and so forth. Totally destabilized. Hey, hey, troll, did you hear what's going on in Yemen?